We will now begin our song service on this Sunday evening. Turn in your hymnals to Amazing Grace. Following that, we will sing Bread of Heaven. Let us begin with Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. This grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Now turn in your hymnal to Bread of Heaven. Guide me, O Thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind... Let us pray. O 
Father, we thank you for the wonderful freedom, privilege, and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this most precious bread of heaven into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, there are a lot of things about pastors that people are kind of mixed up about. They think a a pastor must be perfect. They often quote the verse, a pastor must be above reproach. Well, I want to ask you something. Was the Lord Jesus Christ above reproach? Think about it. What does that mean then? Is it saying a pastor teacher does not fail, does not sin? Our Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. Was he above reproach? Was he not reproached by everyone? Was he not hung on the cross because he was reproached? When it says a pastor must be above reproach, it means he must be above the gossip, the maligning, the judging. In other words, it can't get to him because if it did, he will fail. If I let every mean thing ever said to me or everything where someone tries to teach me when I am the authority, let me put it this way, when I am the authority, well, what makes me above reproach? The fact that it does not affect me in one way. I continue doing what the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded of me what he wants me to do. How he gave me at the point of spiritual birth the gift of pastor teacher without me even knowing it and having it for years without me even knowing it. Having it in high school without me even knowing it. I got to college and I realized it but I didn't know what to do. It's kind of a shock to me. And I looked around at what I had been doing with my life and I thought I had to figure it out. I was going to be a great violinist and hey, guess what? I, I probably could have been if I would have put as much interest into violin playing as I do in the Word of God. I would have been. I might have made it. At least I might have made an income to where I would have lived a life as a musician. A, a musician. But I realized it in college. I said to myself, this isn't, this isn't what I'm called to do. This isn't it. This is just not, it's, it's not it. And some people say, oh, that's just homesickness. No, it wasn't. Of course, there was some homesickness, but that's not what it was. I really thought about it. This is what I need to do. I didn't know what to do afterwards. Well... Because it takes a while after you're called to get it all together and to be prepared enough to where you know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing more than 100% of all the other pastors out there. Now, Here's something that I read earlier. There was a uh, young man, a little boy, who had been listening to his pastor. Now, this kind of goes along with how pastors are criticized. If you hate criticism, don't it, you know, some people lust for the gift of pastor. There are women who lust for the gift of pastor teacher. They'll never have it. There are men who lust for the gift of pastor teacher and try to sneakily and deviously go under the authority of a man and all those people are are rebellious they don't have the gift they're just rebellious people and it doesn't matter what stupid thing that pastor has said it's none of their business 
You are under that authority. If you put yourself in a church where there's a dumb pastor, you're under the authority of that dumb pastor until you leave quietly. And I mean quietly. Some people don't know how to leave quietly. They've got to make a scene. They have to make some type of drama. Why? Arrogance, which is what we're going to study. Arrogance. That's why those who listened to Peter, who hated Peter, were not going to believe in Christ, yet a few did. Arrogance. And I'm going to bring it into the realm of Christianity because Christians, just as unbelievers, can be arrogant for we have an old sin nature. And arrogance is our biggest problem. Mine, too. And yours. Arrogance. Now, I've been doing uh, something on the Internet where I ask questions, and they will all be answered tonight, and then I'll ask some more. And if you've listened to this message, then you're going to know the answer about uh, the question I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask, what is the first act of humility of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? I've taught it before, so you guys probably know it. What is the first act of humility of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm not going to give you the answer because I'm going to ask it. And if you're smart, you'll follow the answers of those who listen to me if you know who, who the people are who do listen. That's as far as I'll go. That's a little hint of what's coming up. What's the first act of humility in the Christian way of life? The very first act I know what the first act of arrogance is. You sin. We all sin. You're saved and then maybe within three hours of being filled with the Spirit, you have a bad thought about someone and boof, you're out of fellowship. What's the first act of humility of the believer? It's very simple. Lewis Perry Schaefer taught it. Well, the thing is, when you're a pastor, some people lust for that gift. Some people have it, and they don't want it. They're smart. Not really. But what I'm saying is they know what is involved with it. And then there are others, especially a lot of women, who don't have the gift, who will never have the gift, who wish they had the gift, who wish they could teach to everyone, and who constantly talk about Titus chapter 2, which I have to stu which we've studied in detail concerning the fact that a spiritually mature woman can teach a younger woman who is not spiritually mature how to love her husband and her children. And that is a spiritual gift, but it is a spiritual gift, one of the few. Spiritual gifts that only operates in spiritual maturity. Because I'll tell you something. The spiritual gift of pastor teacher, it can operate in immaturity and does. I had a teacher ask me once when I was in 10th grade. Now, I wasn't spiritually immature, but I can tell you I wasn't where I am now. I was uh, heading up that hill, as it were. I was moving on upward. But I wasn't even close to where I am now. I thought I was close to where I am now. If I could go back and say, boy, you don't even know anything yet. But I knew a lot. But not as much as I know now. And my teacher said, after I had to write a segment on, well, he said, write what's wrong with America. Ten things. Ten things wrong with America. Well, that was, I said, hey, I can do that very easily. I can put that together within an hour and make it just wonderful. And I did. I got to be on it. Why? Because in there, he gave me a 90. And he felt so bad about giving me a 90, he gave an explanation. And his explanation was, well, you talked a little too much about God in there. This man was a fool and an unbeliever. An ignorant fool. He's in hell now because he was old then now... If he didn't believe, he's in hell, and I really doubt he did. 
I don't know. It would be sad if he were. I mean, I didn't like the guy, so, but I still wouldn't want him to go to hell. Even though he didn't like Reagan's tax cuts, that's almost one good enough reason to want somebody to go to hell. But that's a joke. Some people smile, they don't get it. All right. The guy was an obnoxious jackbutt. And he said to me, but he wasn't being mean when he said it this time, because he had read it. And when he had read it, he knew either there had been a lot of thought been put into it or I had stolen it. The truth is, it was a combination of both. <laughs> I had put a lot of thought into it. I did not steal it, but I had heard many of the things before from my pastor. And I said, these are the ten things wrong with America. I can't remember. I wish I would have saved that thing. And I wish I would have saved that thing where I got 90% for talking too much about God. Because it was there. And the stupid thing is, he wrote it on there. Do you know how fast you could sue somebody for that? But that's not what we are to do as Christians. We are to expect to be persecuted. Anyway, one of the young ladies grabbed hold of what I had written because I got it and I looked at it and I looked at it and I was disgusted. And I said, as someone who is writing about God, this is bullcrap. Flopped it on my desk and forgot about it. And then that the girl next to me, and she was an identical twin to some other girl in some other area, which is a whole other story. But, I mean, they were identical. You couldn't tell them apart. And she said, what is it? Because she, she noticed I was upset. I'm never, I was rarely upset in school. I was always easy going. So she said, so she grabbed it off my desk and read it. And she made more of a big deal out of it than I ever would. She read the whole thing. And then she looked at that teacher and she said, That's right! What are you saying is right! And she was saying it just like that. I mean, she was raising her voice. And the, the teacher was becoming embarrassed and just walking around, kind of hanging his head, you know, trying to act like he didn't hear what she was saying. And then I told her, Don't worry about it. Give it back. Don't worry about it. It, it is what it is. Give it back. So I took it back and I took my little 90 which is a B. You say, I thought 90 was an A. Not in my school. You had to make a 94 to get an A. Nowadays, what do you, 90 to 100 is an A? No. In my school, 94 to 100 was an A. We were one of the top of the line schools. And that's because they were extremely blessed by association. <laughs> Some of you will never really understand what a sense of humor is all about. But anyway, he told me at that time, as an unbeliever, more than likely, he said, I see what you're saying in here. And he felt guilty about it, otherwise he wouldn't approach me about it, because I really didn't say anything about it except, ah, whatever, bullcrap. He don't understand, he's an unbeliever, this is bullcrap, whatever. Whatever. And it was a B. That's not a bad grade. And my parents never did harp on me about grades, which is good. Some parents, they want their kid to be top-notch all the time. And their whole thing is, you have to be val uh, valedictorian. I could have been. I was too lazy, to be honest. Not only that, I had other interests. I had no interest in a lot of the things that were taught. Neither did my parents. <laughs> That's why it was so easy. You just go to school, do what you can, and then you go to work. But then I met parents after I've had, well, I met some parents afterwards. That they're just so wrapped up in my daughter or my son must be valid Victorian. And they're trying to live vicariously through their children. And if their children don't do as well as they expect, then guilt complex comes down like a load of heavy bricks and they destroy the soul of their own children without knowing it, which is sick. Anyway, that unbeliever knew I had the gift of pastor-teacher before I ever knew it. 
Because he said to me, and he said, Hey, are you going to be a preacher after school? And I laughed. I said, <laughs> No. And then he, he was serious in his question. I thought he might have been a bit sarcastic or a bit like, uh, I don't know, I thought he was making fun a little bit, not that it bothered me. But when he asked, I laughed. And, no, I don't plan to be a pastor teacher, and I didn't. But he recognized it, and I think he was an unbeliever. He may have been a believer, I don't know. I think he was an unbeliever. And he said, are you going to be a preacher when you grow up? No. Guess what? God said, yes, you are. Well, this comes down to the fact that the hardest job in the world is pastor teacher. And it doesn't matter if you have a congregation of ten or a congregation of a thousand. If you have a congregation of a thousand, you're, not, you're probably not doing something right unless there's a great revival. But you'll probably have a small congregation and people listening in various parts of the country and the world. One of the things that concerns me but is the fact that I get more response from other countries than I do from right here. And especially among people in my own generation, they despise what I teach. And they tell me about it. People in my generation are screwy. Negative. The children of Israel. Unless they have a change of mind, that's it for America. But we do have another generation, Generation Y. And they'll probably be wondering, why am I here among this mess? Generation Y would be my son Luke, along with all the other little children who, have, uh, who are growing up now. Will they go positive? Well, I guarantee you one thing. So God is long. It, so long as God gives me breath, I'll be teaching. So they'll have the opportunity, and it will be that younger generation. And I do have older generations listening to me, but as far as people my age, it's few and far between. I know of some, and uh, I those that uh, I know of, we have a, a small bond because. We're of the same generation that is the most apostate of all the generations in all of American history. And it's true. We are in a sad situation when it comes to people in their 30s. And it doesn't matter that they've lost their jobs, they have look in their wallet and there's no money, they still, no thought of God, no thought of Bible doctrine. And if they do go to church, it's all legalism. So you have legalists and then you have unbelievers. And you have no true teaching of the Word of God. So, God said in every generation, there will be a pastor to teach. So here I am. Open your ears. Listen, I've got a message. You might, you, you might say, oh, you're arrogant. I have a message that, as far as I know, it's not being taught anymore. Oh, it has been taught. You could go and listen to Colonel Themes tapes and I'd be happy for you. Not only would I be happy for you, I would say, why don't you come over to my house and we'll both sit down and watch some Colonel Theme videos and we can watch them all day if you want to. And yet there's still a bitterness there between people of my generation because they, I think in their projection they can't believe that somebody would do something out of pure motivation. There's always that projection. Why are you doing Are you trying to be popular? Are you trying to make money? Are you trying to get women? What? Why would you do it? What's in it for you? Oh, there's a lot in it for me, but that's not even the point either. What it, what's in it for me? I'm happy. I'm probably the happiest 34-year-old on the face of the earth. Period. Over and out. And if there's another one happier, I want to meet them. Because I want to party with them. I want to go out and have fun and see things with them. Male or female.
people are evil because of the old sin nature. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. So they always assume the worst in someone else. Why do this? Why do that? Why spend all your time doing this and that? And, and, and why don't you just relax? Why don't you just quit? That's Satan. Peter did that to our Lord. He said, Lord, no, no, no. That will never happen to you. And what did, Peter, what did our Lord say to Peter, the great apostle, that the Catholics worship? He said, get behind me, Satan. Well, here's part of what it is to be a pastor. Here's a question from a young man. And it wouldn't be too shocking to hear this as a pastor. And, and you know what? The, the profession that has the biggest burnout is profession of pastor-teacher. They just burn out and they quit. They can't handle it. Because some of them have the wrong idea that it's all about uh, pleasing people and getting people to like them and having a personality. And they don't realize it's not you, it's the message. It's the message, it's the message, it's the message. And what, what, I, what I'm about to read you, this would cause about 75% of pastors to fall apart and then call up the person who said it. But here it is. After the church service, a little boy came up to the pastor and told him, when I grow up, I'm going to give you some money. Well, thank you, the pastor replied. But why? Because my daddy says, you're one of the poorest preachers we have ever had. <laughs> now, you do hear these stuff like this. And one thing about children, they're honest. When it, they don't know what's offensive and what's not yet. You learn that as you grow old. You, you learn that as you start to sophisticate your old sin nature. And you know how to hide it. And uh, you know how to say one thing behind somebody's back and say another to their face. But the child, they just hear what they hear and they just go off with it. Oh, do I have some stories of when I was a child when I heard some stuff and I won't have... That means I'd have to gossip about my parents to even tell you the story. <laughs> I won't go there. But we've all done it. I've gossiped. And maligned. And judged. And committed those sins, but then named them. And that's not an excuse. You name it, otherwise you're up the creek without a paddle. Well, that's the job of a pastor. He's going to be criticized. And if you have the gift of pastor-teacher, and I've met some people online, uh, some younger men uh, who are in their early 20s, very early 20s, and I have recognized in them that they have the gift of pastor-teacher. And they say, I think I'm an evangelist. I know better. You're not an evangelist. You want to be a pastor. You may want to be an evangelist, but you've got the gift of pastor teacher. I had a friend one time tell me, if I had to choose my gift, it'd be evangelist, because for one thing, you don't have to study. And for another, all you do is get up and give the gospel, and all these people around you love you. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a way to put it, but still, even as an evangelist, you have your own spiritual life to live. But it is true that the gift of evangelism does not receive that antagonism. The gift of pastor teacher receives the most antagonism at, of all the gifts. That's why there's double blessing and that's why there's double cursing. There is antagonism toward it. Because people have false standards and they think, well, if you have the gift of pastor teacher, you have to act a certain way. Uh, you have to avoid especially the overt sins. You could never do an overt sin and be a pastor. Oh, you could talk about a member of your congregation who's failed or done something that you think they've done wrong. That's fine. But uh, you better not do anything and you better not go astray overtly or I am going to rip you a new one. And you have those. 
Well, that just means a lack of understanding of Scripture. Pastors have issues. And you know, as humans do, we're human beings. Now, if, if God were so concerned that a pastor be beyond reproach, which is what people think they say, a pastor must be beyond reproach, it means a pastor can't live a normal life, a pastor can't be like someone else, a pastor must be at least halfway sinless. I mean, you know he's going to sin, but he must do those sins in private. And and he's got to be at least extremely secret about it. And if he does do a sin, it better be a respectable sin that I agree with. I mean, if I hate somebody, he better hate that person too. And if he talks about that person that I hate, well, he's all right with me. But if he does a sin that I don't like and is disgusting to me, then I will rip him apart. Well, who are you? Are you God? No, you're not. I've been whipped enough by God. And, and don't step in the way because it's going to hurt. I'll, I'll tell you from experience, it hurts bad. <laughs> it hurts, but for good reason. It straightens you out. It makes you think which is what you need to do. And uh, it, keeps those, it keeps you from being run by emotion. You start to get to run by emotion, and next thing you know, uh, you're in all sorts of trouble. And the, the whole, your whole life around you is in a whirlwind, and it changes in two seconds. Why did that happen? Well, God has a whip, and he'll use it out of love to whip you into line. We all have an area of weakness. Pastors have an area of weakness. We're human beings. You have an area of weakness. Everyone has an area of weakness. So, what? Have you never heard of live and let live? Are you not an American? Have you ever heard of the word freedom? Live and let live? Hey, I live in Ohio. and One thing I've noticed about Ohio is there's a lot of live and let live. I don't know my neighbor over there, but I'm pointing over to the next door neighbor there. And I don't know the person over here. The only thing I know about the, the person over here, there's an Asian lady married to a guy who I think is Caucasian, but I really can't remember. Oh, there you go. See, that shows how much I care about race. There's an Asian married to a black man over there. I wondered why that black man walked out of her house. I could have been judgmental like they were in the South or are and say, ooh, that Asian lady's committing adultery with a big black man. No, they do that in the South. Why are you looking like that? They do it in the South and you know it. They do it everywhere. Gossip, malign, judge. I did see that man walk out of her house. And the first thing somebody would think in South Carolina, I know it, especially in a town called Chesney, is Asian woman, black man. Black man walks out of Asian woman house early in the morning and gets the mail. What is the talk of the day? A black man and an Asian woman. Making love in the middle of the night. How terrible. They're married! That's why I got the hell out of there so fast. Oh, I hated that place. I moved away from that place at one point, and I couldn't believe the difference in culture when I got out of there and moved to Austin, Texas, which is slightly liberal, actually a lot liberal, but the attitude of live and let live is wonderful. Freedom. I'm free. And then I moved back. Oh, I had a job there. It was good. But when it got to 112 degrees and my steering wheel was melting and you couldn't do anything but sit in your house all day under an air condition that barely kept you cool, I said, I'm through with this mess. I can't, I can't handle it. But it was a lot better to handle than what I came back to. And I'm not talking about my family. I'm talking about coming back to the southeast where I got into a job where all they did was wham, and yamp, and yamp, and yamp, and yamp, and gossip my line and judge. And they would gossip and malign and judge about the very same sins that they commit. And it was a difference in culture. Some people say, they'd say, you know what, Andy? 
You're talking out of your head. Everybody's the same everywhere. No, they're not. That's why you have pivots here and there and everywhere else. There is positive volition. And then sometimes people understand some principles in one area that they don't understand in another area. And because of the apostasy of the Baptist church, the South is the reason why this country is falling apart, not the North. Oh, although the North was punished first because the pivot left the North first. It went south. Now it's gone there as well. Where's it going to end up now? It's going to end up in Ohio or in some other part of the world, period. The Midwest or somewhere else, because I can tell you that I know this isn't being taught. Not with authority. Oh, it's being taught. Some of it's being taught. I'll tell you how some of it's being taught. I've heard it. Here it is. You can enter into gate one of the cosmic system. Gate one of the cosmic system is motivational arrogance. That means you are motivated by your own arrogance. And then you move to number two, negative volition. And that means you're negative to God's word. And that means you might be one who will go down to the river and gamble in the gambling boat. Wrong! You're talking stupid! You're using doctrine and then enter trying to put some yeast in it. Let me tell you something about gambling. I'm up. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying it's never a problem with some people. Of course it is. And uh, God says that you have to provide for your own family, and if you don't, you're worse than an unbeliever. And those who have an addiction to gambling act worse than an unbeliever because they're so self-absorbed in their self-indulgence that they will let their family starve just so they can get the thrill out of gambling. I understand that's an an addiction. But if you're ahead, there's no problem. You made money. How's that a problem? You went in, you gambled, you made money, you went home. And you had more money for your family. How's that a problem? Whose problem is it? Only the problem of the legalist who looks down their nose at what everyone else does without knowing all the facts. There are legalists who will look at someone who has worked hard their whole life and now they've retired, and they decide that they want to go put $100 in a machine just for fun. They don't expect to win. They want to win. And they put $100 in the machine, and well, that, that kind of thing, where there's enough skill to it, but that's what they like doing. It's the thing. Push the button. And then they win five cents. And everybody goes crazy. I won five cents. I won five cents. But a legalist will say, oh, that's wrong. And the reason, they'll say, oh, they gambled over the Lord's clothes. Well, you better believe it. They put a robe on him for a king. You're going to gamble over that. That is, that is worth some money. And he, he was going to die in his own body. Oh, his body would be, well, his body died and they took it off and they said, here it is. Now let's gamble over it. And then they say, see, you can't gamble. They gambled over the Lord's clothes. Yeah, the Lord's clothes were were worth at that time a lot of money. And uh, that doesn't mean anything. So what? They gambled over his clothes. And they make such a big deal out of that that it's stupid. They gambled over his clothes. Yes. And those people who gambled over his clothes, every single one of their sins was imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ and judged and the pain was so great that he bled blood, that he shed tears of blood out of his eyeballs. Jesus Christ took care of all that. If you think gambling is a sin, it's not. It could be. But not the gambling itself. What the sin would be, you don't provide for your family. Yes, that's a sin. 
Not only is it a sin, it's wrongdoing. You're a fool. You're worse than an unbeliever. You're in for serious punishment. But to go out and have some entertainment, nothing wrong with that. It's called living. What do you do in life? If you want to have a happy life, what do you do? You work hard. And you play all the harder. And playing is not sinful. What do children do? Play. Why? It's fun. You think God wants us to be all morbid and just walk around with our heads down and be worried about everything? No, but I know a lot of legalists just like it and they have the money to have a good time, but they never will. They'll always be miserable. I'd have more money with one dollar than they'd have with a million. I'd have more, more fun with no money than they'd have with a million. Capacity for life comes from learning the Word of God. And so what we have is totally weird thinking going on and we have a falling away. A bunch of people who used to know grace have now become shipwrecked. And they've become shipwrecked because they decided to listen to a multitude of pastors because they have itching ears. So when their toes are stepped on by one pastor, they run to another. And then when their toes are stepped on by that pastor, they run to another until they find the one sweet pastor who they think is so beautiful and mushy and can say such, such beautiful things. But then they even get tired of that and move on. These are the people who are always learning but are never able to come to an understanding of the truth. Bible doctrine. Why? Because they do not stick to a pastor who teaches Bible doctrine. I'm the pastor for this generation. Well, you can move into gate one. The gates of cosmic one. And this is by Colonel Thane. Always give him credit. I'm never ashamed to do that. He's my mentor, my human mentor. He's the greatest man since the Apostle Paul. I'd be I wouldn't know it a damn thing without his ministry. And without the power of the Spirit. Not a damn thing. So you go into gate one. What's gate one? Well, that has to do with a hang-up. Where do you have a hang-up in your life? It could be in many different areas. We all grow up in an environment and you develop a hang-up. Maybe you grew up under a mother who was too heavy-handed and extremely legalistic. And so it causes a hang-up, which is called guilt, worry, anxiety. And she doesn't care because she's cruel. And some of the cruelest people can be women, to be frank with you. And some of the cruelest people can be men too. Now, it is true, men murder more. But, you know, a woman knows how to murder slowly the soul. A man will just get enraged and murder the body, which is evil. But a woman can under, once she gets a little thunder, uh, authority under her belt, you know. Now she has a child. She has authority over the child. And so here comes guilt complex. David lived under that environment. David was a black sheep. David, I'm talking about King David. David had a father who didn't think anything of him. Nothing. In fact, it seems as if his father disliked him. And his mother, is, not, is barely even mentioned, must have had the same exact attitude. Maybe the father got that attitude from the mother. But either way, the father would say, David, you are responsible for the sheep. So what did David do? He went out at a very young age as a teenager. Late teens, mid-teens, late teens. And his father gave him a job to do and he went and did it and he fulfilled it perfectly under humility. And at the same time, he loved the Lord. And he knew Samuel, which means he had been to some messages and he learned about some Bible doctrine at a very young age. And this is rare. It's very rare. Most people, if you're going to get on doctrine, it's going to be 
in your late 20s or early 30s, and that's about it. And, and then you can be, if you're an unbeliever, you can believe at 40 and then get on doctrine fine. But uh, for the average, it's uh, most people try to get stuff figured out by their late 20s into their 30s. David had it figured out in his teens. Then he went astray when he got all this uh, prosperity and wealth that he'd never seen before. It's kind of like uh, David never did sow his oats when he was young, when he was a teenager. He had a sense of responsibility. David had more of a sense of responsibility as a teenager than he did as king when he went out and did Operation Bathsheba. He would have never done that as a teenager or as a young man in his early 20s. He would have never even thought of it. But he got on the Bible doctrine and he had a sense of responsibility and he was faithful to whatever his father asked him to do, faithful to his family, and his family hated him. His whole family, not just his father. His father didn't even consider him to be a possibility for king because when Samuel came along, he said, Jesse, is this all the children you have? Because the Lord had rejected all of those. And he says, ah, I have one. The shepherd named David. He's out with the sheep. And then when Samuel said, Bring him to me, it shocked his father, I guarantee you. His father was already pushing him. Ah, yeah, 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 we do, but he's just a he's a shepherd. He can't be. That's not the next king. You're silly. And then Samuel said, Bring him to me. And then he agreed and brought David to him. And then Samuel finally came to the doctrinal conclusion. God does not look on the outward appearance, but he looks upon the stream of consciousness. What's the stream of consciousness? What you think. You are what you think. Now what Peter thought before the Holy Spirit came upon him was a bunch of human viewpoint. He would go under fear, anxiety, He would go under impulsive arrogance and chop off a man's ear suddenly. You say, well, isn't that brave? No, it was stupid. And our Lord said, no, 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 no. You're being a criminal. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. In other words, no Christian activism. That's all we see today in this country. Christian activism on the one hand, liberal activism on the other hand, And the only thing holding us together is a pivot. A few people who understand God, a few people who are the salt of the earth, and we would not be here if it weren't for them. We wouldn't be here at all. We shouldn't be here. There's no reason why we should be here. No country in the world has ever spent this much money and still had prosperity and been around. Never has it ever happened in all of history. So why does it happen now? Pivot. But God's warning us. I mean, look at it. I can't even bring it into human terms, the amount of money the United States spends just on nothing. I can't even, I can't make you realize how much it is. It's so far outside of our frame of reference. It would just, uh, if you could really see it in your frame of reference, If every American could see in how they think in their own frame of reference of how much this government is spending and what it is doing in power and lust, we would have a revolution like you've never seen. It would be a bad revolution. There's not a good revolution. You know why? We could take what the government spends in one day and fill up that whole farm right there behind there and fill it up so high with dollar bills, we wouldn't even see how high it goes. And I'm talking one day. And then I'd be out there, you know, with my wheelbarrow or I'd go rent a truck or something and bring it in. But great, that's that money becomes worthless. You keep printing it and printing it and printing it. And you say, well, why does it have value now? God! 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 <laughs> That's how my little son Luke says it now. God.
and we have we're so messed up, but we we're still here. Why are we still here? Maybe, just maybe, there'll be a turnaround. If not, then it's we're gone as a country. But I'll still be preaching whether gone or not as a country. Unless they shoot me for preaching, and that'd be just fine with me. Because I love America, and if they're going to start shooting me for preaching, do it now. Don't even wait. I'll just go on to be with the Lord. I don't want to watch my country fall. I mean, really. So gate one of the cosmic system is the hang-up. And we all have a hang-up. And that hang-up usually comes from either environment. You have a certain trend of the old sin nature. Oftentimes it comes from environment where you develop a hang-up in life because maybe you grew up in a household where your mother was constantly nagging you. Nah, 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 nah. You can never do anything right, so you have a hang-up. You develop an inferiority complex. Or maybe just the opposite happened. You grew up in a liberal-type household where you could do no wrong, and you were just the most wonderful thing ever. And if uh, 2 plus 2 equals 5, then little Johnny, you're a genius. And little Johnny, you can do nothing wrong and I will spoil you. Now, grandparents have a right to spoil their grandchildren. They've already done their work with their children. I'm talking about parents who have a responsibility. And then little Johnny can do nothing wrong. Little Johnny can do everything wrong. Then you have those who will allow for the arrogance of well, they have that human self-esteem. And so that's called superiority arrogance. Inferiority, arrog inferiority complex versus the superiority complex. But it's the same thing. Arrogance. The inferiority complex says I am great, but nobody recognizes me as great. The superiority complex says I'm great and I will be recognized as great. And if I am not, I will bully my way into greatness. And you see this in business all the time. And the more doctrine I know, the more I see it and the more I laugh at it all. And the more I think people catch on that this guy knows what's going on around here. Maybe I should shy away from this fellow. He knows what I'm doing in my superiority complex. Or he knows my wicked plans. I'll shy away. Or I'll attack, either one. Usually shy away. It just depends on God's will. Does God want you to be in that job or not? If he does, there ain't nothing, he can, nothing anyone can do about it. If he doesn't, well, you get fired and then smile on your way out. Don't make a big deal out of it. Walk out peacefully. Just as you would when you quit a church. You walk out peacefully. That's called humility. If you want to make a big deal out of something, and you want to say, well, you did this wrong, and you did that wrong, and I don't believe this, and I don't believe that, that's arrogance. You've already failed in your spiritual life, unless you rebound and keep moving. I don't know how many times. I remember I had my uh, church down in South Carolina. How long have I been preaching anyway? Let me see. All right. I can talk about this part and then we'll get moving. I had a church in South Carolina and uh, there were people there who wanted to tell me when to preach, how to preach, how long to preach. Their daughter had to go to cheerleading. Uh, now their daughter's too old to cheerlead. Uh, how long to preach? When to preach? There was an ice storm. No, I don't come preach. There's an ice storm. There's no electricity. I don't care. I can talk with no electricity. What's wrong with you people? And they hated the idea of listening to doctrine daily. You want to know something about the Apostle Paul? <laughs> People love listening to him talk from 7 in the morning till 8 at night. Or actually, most of the time, the Apostle Paul was a night owl like me. And he would teach from uh, sunset at around 7 or 8 all the way until the sun would rise at about 7 or 8. Twelve hours straight of preaching. 
And some of you can't handle an hour or an hour and a half. Now why not? Well, you don't have the attitude of David who was a murderer, a rapist, an adulterer. I mean, David sinned a lot. And if you want to think in terms of self-righteousness, you would say, if you were a legalist, you would think to yourself, David wasn't the greatest king. Saul was the greatest king. After all, Saul had one wife he never cheated on. Saul had a family he loved. Saul never did any overt type activity that you would consider terrible, except he killed some priests who were, well, after all, he had a right to kill those priests because of the revolutionary David. That's how they thought, self-justification. And they thought David was a revolutionary Oh, he was revolutionary, all right, but he was never seeking the power. God said you'll be king, and one thing about David is he, he didn't jump up and run up into the castle and said, Hey, Saul, I'm king now. God told me. Bye. He waited and waited and waited and waited. And then he had to go through testing. And he was tested by Saul, his greatest enemy. And what did he do towards Saul? Showed him the utmost of respect. Because Saul was the king and his authority. And that's humility. That's what promotes. Humility promotes. Arrogance demotes. And we are a nation of arrogance. And we're being demoted. Well, in these last few minutes... I might as well get to some mechanics because all of this application must be boring. Here we go. Let's get to something exciting. Gate one. Gate one, the hang up. Everyone has a hang up. And it could be an antinomian hang up. That means self-indulgence. What does self-indulgence include? You like a lot of sex. Self-indulgence. That goes for teenagers and people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, even some up to 50. Once you get up to 80, forget it. They don't care anymore. Although, actually they do. If you go to an Alzheimer's area, there's old men still, horny as all can be, trying to get with women. But you have the hang-ups. And you have the antinomian, which involves sex. It involves whatever you see in our modern culture, that is the antinomian. Our modern culture is antinomian. Now, my grandparents, on the other hand, legalistic. Not just, I'm not talking about just my grand. I'm talking about the World War II generation. They were principled, but they were legalistic in every way. And as a result, they failed in the raising of their children. So guess what they had? A generation of rebellious children, but they just happened to turn out to have the greatest number of people who became positive toward the Word of God. Now that's God's grace. And now you have my generation. They could care less. They wouldn't listen to me for one second. They already know it all. They've got life figured out. They'll tell you they've got life figured out. Although they don't. They'll tell you, ah, just live with her. What's all this marriage about? Why would you get married? You're going to get divorced anyway. Where would they get that from? The previous generation. They saw their parents get divorced and all that. And they justify it and they say, eh, marriage, that's stupid. Nobody stays married. If you find somebody, love them for the moment. They even make songs about it. And oh my gosh, if you could hear some of the songs that my generation listens to, for some of you who are over the age of 40, you would, uh, if you were a legalist, you would uh, fall over. You would say, it's all, uh, I don't know what you would do. You, you probably wouldn't understand it. You'd say, what did he just say? Because they're using words that are gross, but they're a koine English that, a, a koine English that even uh, language changes so that the parents don't even know what's, what they're talking about. 
and the children get together and they start talking on the phone at age 13 and 14 and they're, they're using certain language and their parents don't know what they're saying and all they're talking about is degeneracy. But you don't know what, you don't know what they're talking about and you just leave them alone. You have no idea. I do. I have a big idea of what's going on. Child abuse on every level. 13, 14, 15 year olds exposed to sex, drugs, alcohol. Not just that, even younger. Before, before even going through puberty. It's sick out there. Well, we're not the only country, but we are a client nation to God. I mean, this happens in Russia. Definitely in Russia. It happens in China. It happens all over the world. But we're a client nation. And there was a time in the 1950s where children could go out and play and nobody thought anything about it. Freedom! There was a time in the 1950s where the children could all hop in the back of the uh, pickup truck and they would all go down to the lake and go for a swim or go fishing. And nobody would say a word about it. No seat belts. No seat. What is a seat belt? They didn't. Sometimes cars didn't even have seat belts. What's that all about? You're going to go somewhere. You're going to drive there and you're going to have fun. And then these nosy busybodies come along and say, oh, you got to have a seat belt. Put in a seat belt. And then, and then oh, now you've got to wear the seat belt. Wear the seat belt. And then, oh, no, they're too small. They can't even just wear a seat belt. They have to be put in a certain chair. And I will design the chair that they need to be in. And not only that, I'll get a kickback of money from the people who design the chair that they need to be in. And we have gone so far into corruption and a loss of freedom and nobody knows and nobody cares and they just follow right along. And some of you may have asked before when you've watched something like the Schindler's List and you've said, how did the Jews just keep going along with that? How did they end up in the ghetto? And then how did they end up going from the ghetto to this place where they thought they may have some hope of doing some type of work? Maybe they could play their violin. Maybe they could make some type of uh, artillery shell. But they were gassed. Where did that attitude come from? How did that happen? Because freedom is taken away bit by bit by bit. And you cave in here, and you cave in there. And you cave in with the seatbelt. You might say, oh, you're talking nonsense. Seatbelt law. Seatbelts save lives. Who says? Who says? Where you'll say, I'll show you the statistics. Do you know what? When they raise the speed limit from 55 to 75 or whatever it is, wherever you live, the amount of deaths went down on the roadway. And in those areas, such as Montana and Texas, where Texas raised their speed limit to 95 miles an hour, the number of accidents went down. You see, you can't go by those statistics because they are always manipulated by many, 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 many different facts. Oh, you could say in the 80s, accidents are going up. Why? Prosperity! Everybody was driving everywhere. Now, there's far fewer deaths now. Poverty! People don't have the money to drive anywhere. And nothing to do with a seatbelt to start with. But you follow right along. That's the authority. And should you? Yes. They are the authority. You elected them. I wear my seatbelt. Does it make me bilious? Yes. But if they ever start going against my constitutional rights, that's it. I'm stopping. I'm not going any further. They tell me I can't preach the gospel of Christ, they can forget that. They can throw me in jail. I'll preach it in jail. It would make me so upset I would preach it in jail for 24 hours straight until I fell asleep. And then when I got up, I would keep on preaching it. And don't think it can't happen in this country. It surely can. Why? The interlocking systems of arrogance which believers are getting involved in. Number one, the hang-up. We've all got it. And if you don't rebound, you'll never get out of it. You'll never grow out of it. Gate two, negative volition arrogance. 
That is, you don't want to listen to some preacher. You don't want to listen to a man. After all, he's just a man. Why listen to just a man? I heard that a comedian talking about it and it made quite a lot of sense. He said, I don't really like church and I definitely don't like going to the Catholic church because I look up there and I see this man talking gibberish and I say, he's just a man like me. Why listen? Well, authority, that's why. But in the case of the Catholic church, well, you're in the wrong place. The authority is the word of God and God has placed the gift of pastor, teacher in certain men. Why? In certain men who you would think would never have any authority. The Apostle Paul was described as a short, bald man with a pot belly. I don't know if that's true or not, but that comes out in the Acts of uh, Thessalonica, which some of it is definitely false. The Apostle Paul was not in love with any woman. The Apostle Paul was in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can't imagine him having a pot belly as far as he, his energy went and as far as he would go around the whole world walking and going from town to town to town to town to town. Now being short and having a high squeaky voice, I do believe that. Why? Because his only friend left was Luke. I think of Paul as being a short, ugly man. He had no friends. But when he spoke, people listened. That is, for a time. But after that, it was all over. His, once his ministry was over, it was just him and Luke. But little did he know that some 2,000 years later, there would be another little short man teaching exactly what he taught. Oh, he probably knew it. But not only just a little short man, but... Men beforehand, tall men, all men. All men who had the gift of pastor, teacher, teaching what Paul wrote in the epistles. Yet when he died, he had one friend. No family member. You ever thought about that? Where was Paul's family? Where were they? A lot of people make a big deal out of family, and family is wonderful as a divine institution. And you can have great love in family and you can have great division in family and great fights in family. And God instituted family, so there's nothing wrong with it. But where was Paul's family? He had Luke. Best friend. Sometimes it's best just to have a best friend than to have some large family. That's why our Lord said, Who is my mother? Because they kept saying, Your mother's calling for you. Of course she was. She was distressed. Your mother's calling for you. Jesus, Jesus, your mother's calling for you. Who is my mother? He said, hanging on a cross and teaching a doctrine while in extraordinary pain and teaching it in such a way that he taught it forcefully hanging on a cross. He had to suck it into his lungs, which were hanging down. Now, he's on a cross. It would be like, me. look, hang me here to where I'm hanging. And then out, my lungs are sinking down and everything. And I'm in a lot of pain. And then I get up enough gumption to say, who is my mother? He had to really make a point out of it. I mean, it was hard to even speak. You're in such excruciating pain. But he did. Who is my mother? And then he pointed to the disciples who would later become apostles and said, This is my mother. This is my father. This is my brother. This is my sister. In other words, royal family of God. Our Lord was about to assume his position as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords without a royal family of God. And he knew it. And he was looking ahead in terms of looking ahead, looking ahead in the light of eternity. And so people didn't understand what he was talking about. People are always living in the moment, in the what's going on right now in your life. And you're thinking about what's happening in your life. And you're thinking about I don't know, whatever you think about. The diet you're going to go on, the money you're going to save, it's normal. How many hours over time you're going to work, I think about that. How are you going to pay for your gas, a lot of people think about that. Etc. Thinking in terms of 
the earth. What what are you going to do on the earth? And you have to. You're on the earth. You have to think about certain things on the earth. But our Lord was about to go and he wasn't thinking in terms of none of that. He was done with that. It was all over. He was about to go to be in eternity forever and he was ready. And he didn't even want to answer his own mother. He knew she would be all right. He's the Lord. And it also goes to show that he made an extremely bold statement because he did not want his mother to be idolized as the Catholics idolize the uh, Mother Mary, they call her. He didn't want her to be idolized. If she was so great, as soon as somebody said, Lord, your mother calls for you, he would say, Oh, sweet mother, please tell me, what do you think? That's how it would go with the Catholic Church. But he said, Who is my mother? And he did so while he was hanging on a cross in extreme pain. That shows how far off the Catholics are. They don't know anything about family or anything else. Bunch of goofballs. Well, gate three is authority arrogance, and that means you're unteachable. And the worst thing ever is to be unteachable. And I guess we'll go through number three and that'll be it. But I have something to say about being unteachable. There are geniuses who are totally unteachable, but they're geniuses. Now, I was thinking about this the other day because I work for a bank and I have to deal with certain things related to fraud and people call up and say this happened to my account it was obviously fraudulent and we have to do an investigation and then the team goes out and does it and oftentimes it is fraudulent and I tell these people I say look and they say but how does this happen I've got my card in my hand how do they have my information that uh, they're out in California buying stuff and I got my card in my hand. I said, these people are smart. In fact, they may be geniuses. And they may do very well. I've even said this. I said, they may, do, they may have done very well in life if they didn't decide to, do, to, to go the criminal way because it takes a lot to break through that system. I mean, the precautions that PNC makes for fraud is probably the most stringent precautions of any bank in America. And it's so stringent, it pisses the customer off, but it's for their benefit. And there's so much fraud going on out there and everything else. And here are these people, and they're so smart they can break a code. They can go in and take people's money. Now, if you're that smart, you can get a job. But no, they're not going to get a job. They're going to go under arrogance, criminal arrogance, and do whatever they want. Use their genius in a wrong way. And that's criminal arrogance. I mean, really, look. There are some people who have great talent in the area of sales. So what do they sell? Drugs. Well, first of all, that's an easy thing to sell. A lot of people want it. But they even know how to get people hooked on it, and then they get their customer, they get their clientele. They'll say, here, try this. Okay. And they try, and they like it. Say, oh, you like that, did you? Hey, I'll give you double the amount. Just give me two bucks. All right, I'll do it. And then they're hooked. Next thing they know, they're spending two, three, four, five hundred bucks a week on whatever junk that man is, sale is selling. But he could have been a salesman. And, and made a good living without selling drugs, without doing anything criminal. Now, well, that's criminal arrogance for you. And it always comes from authority arrogance, which is you're unteachable. And if you're unteachable, it doesn't matter if you're genius or not. If you're unteachable, you're dumb. There are geniuses who are unteachable. But, and they, they are genius, but they're, they're still dumb. You can't teach them a thing. They know it all. They already know it. Unteachable. 
When you get to the arrogance, stage three, the cosmic system, the arrogance of being unteachable, it has a lot to do with many things. Hypersensitivity. Some people could listen to this message and say, the only thing he did was talk about me through the whole message, and I don't know you from Adam. I've had people come up to me and say, hey, were you talking about me in this message? I'm, I'm, I'm being for real. I don't make things up. I've had people call me. Were you talking about me in that message? And I would laugh. No, but now I know what you do. And I would say it just like that. <laughs> and then I would say, but I don't care. I've done the same things too. What's the big deal? It's sin. You rebound, you keep moving. People get so hung up, hang up, on what other people are doing and their sins. And they, they get offended because... Maybe somebody knows that they sin. So what? Everybody knows I sin. So what? That's what. That's the way I look at it. So what? Everybody knows I sin. So what? That's why the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross to die as a substitute for all of us. You want to know something? If I were the only human being alive who had an old sin nature, he would have died for me and me alone. So do you think I feel guilty for anything somebody wants to put a guilt complex on me about? You better believe I say no. I'm not embarrassed and I don't feel guilty because I know I have a Lord Jesus Christ who loves me so much that if I were the only person on the face of the earth who sinned, he would have come down and died as a substitute for me. I know it. But he not only did it for me, he did it for all of us. And even the unbelievers. Even those who reject him. How dare you judge? That's why those are the worst of the sins. Because our Lord has so much love, he would die on your behalf. And yet you, not just you, but all of us, with our deceitful hearts, we're ready to criticize. Our Lord was ready to save. We're all ready to criticize. Time for that to stop. It's time for us to understand we have a spiritual life to live. It's time for us to understand the importance of the filling of God the Holy Spirit as we've been studying with Peter, who became a totally different person. And we'll get to that. And you say you're going awful slow through this series. You better believe it. There may be a thousand hours in this act series by the time I'm done with it. And it's not the same as what the colonel taught. I've received some snarky things. I won't listen to that. It'll be just the same as what the colonel taught. You'll just be... No, <laughs> It's not even close to the same. Oh, it's the colonel's doctrines, but he didn't know a lot of these things in 1965. He taught them later. So I'm able to put it all together in terms of Acts right now. But most people will never get it because of arrogance, and it's going to take a new generation, a younger one, and maybe the older one that will wake up, but my generation, they despise my guts. People older, they, yeah, some listen who are older. People younger, yeah, some people listen who are younger. People my age, no way. Not as far as I know. They despise it. And I think it has to do with the fact that they say, I'm your age too, and I've done nothing I know nothing. I despise you. Why? Jealousy. And it's a weird jealousy against the spiritual life. And all they have to do is be positive. They should say, wow. They should be motivated. They should say, wow. A guy my age and my generation loving the Word of God. I need to get on board. But arrogance won't let them. Arrogance says... Ooh, I didn't learn that much. I was in Baraka Church too, and I didn't learn that much, they say to themselves. Why didn't I learn that much, and why don't I care? So there comes the despising. So very quickly now, through the interlocking system of arrogance, very quickly, and we'll explain each and every one of them tomorrow night. But very quickly through the interlocking systems of arrogance. 
And they interlock because this is how it starts. You have a motivation, number one. Motivational arrogance. Everything starts with a motivation. You're either motivated to learn the Word of God or you're motivated to do something else. But you're motivated to do something. Everybody has a motivation. You're even motivated to be lazy if you want to be lazy. Where's your motivation? I want to sit on my butt. I'm motivated to sit on my butt. I don't want to do anything. And you've heard people like that. I've heard people say that. And not to be critical, but I've heard people say who have worked uh, their whole, they've worked a, a long week, maybe six days, doing some overtime, and they say, tomorrow I am going to sit on my butt and do nothing. And they'll brag about it. Well, that's their motivation, to sit on their butt and do nothing. I understand it. But you can have a motivational arrogance, and that is, what motivates you? Are you motivated to grow in grace and in knowledge? Or are you motivated to just live in the cosmic system and gossip about everybody, make somebody else look bad just because you don't like them, because they've tried to make you look bad in the past? Revenge motivation. Revenge modus operandi. Motivation. Motivation. That's your motivation. What should your motivation be? Meditate on thy word both day and night all the time. And David did. And a lot of people didn't understand David because, and a lot of people today don't understand David because he committed rape, adultery, and murders. And more than that. But we won't get into that. Those were the overt things. And God said, David, you are a man after my own heart. Why? Motivation. Yes, he sinned, but he rebounded. And then what did he do? He thought about the Lord. He thought about the law of the Lord, which means the doctrine of the Lord. Both day and night, it never left his thoughts. It was always an application. It's always a thought of, this is the way the Lord would want it. Here's an application concerning this. Here's an application concerning that. And the Word of God so burns in my bones that uh, that's why I have very few friends. And the friends I do have, they're believers. And uh, if I do have a friend, they're going to end up being preached to. It's my gift. It's going to happen. And, uh, but they're only going to be preached to if they ask. Well, if you ask, you've got it coming. Such as, as I told you in the last message, uh, a friend asking me about relationships, how they go, how hard they are, and what you should do, and then going into the scripture and saying, this is the way this is, should be. And I said, well, uh, that's true, but you got to look at both sides. And uh, But I'm not going to say anything because it's just going to make you mad. So I'm just not going... Well, well what, do you, what do you mean? Well, I'll, I'll get... Uh, it's in the Bible, and I just don't want to say it. And if I say it, you'll be mad at me. But if you read it in the Bible, it'll be okay. Okay, go get the Bible then, and, and then I'll read it. Okay, fine. Flipped it right there. Poop, poop. There you go. Read it. Guess who got mad at me? And not the Bible. <laughs> but only for a moment. Open to it, maybe. But it doesn't matter. Some things step on our toes. There, there are things I read in the Bible all the time. I get my toes stepped on. And I say, I, I really wish that verse wasn't there. But it's there. It's glaring me in the face. I don't like it. I don't like you telling me what to do, verse. Why are you telling me? I enjoy doing that. What are you doing? I hate you, verse. And you've all had that thought. Whether you know it or not, you might have known the verse was there, but you just say, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I hate it. But you have to come to where you say, all right, God's right. I'm wrong. i got to do what it says. And of course you're going to slip up. You have an old sin nature. But you're going to do what it says. Authority. So let's go through the gates and then end it. I said I wouldn't go for an hour and 30 minutes and so let me see what happened. I didn't go for an hour and 30 minutes. I'll be done here in an hour and 29 minutes. Isn't that something? <laughs>
Some of you can't laugh because you're already half asleep. Number one, motivational arrogance. Number two, negative volition. Number three, authority arrogance, a big problem in the United States. Number four, self-righteous arrogance. Number five, sexual arrogance, a huge problem in the United States among people in my generation. They are sex mad. And you know what? You can't really blame it. Have you watched TV lately? Those of you who are older and you stick your nose up in the air and say, I was never as disgusting as this next generation coming up. Why are you putting that crap on our television? Don't get self-righteous. Self-righteous arrogance. Number five, sexual arrogance. Number six, criminal arrogance. There's a lot of believers who are criminals, believe it or not. I may have been married to one. Number Seven, psychotic arrogance. You say, oh, you shouldn't say. You need a personal life. Probably not, but I did. Number seven, psychotic arrogance. Grandiosity. I might have been married to one of them too. Number eight, the arrogance of unhappiness and self-pity. We've all been married to that, right? And you yourself have been that way. Number nine, iconoclastic arrogance. You make an icon or an idol out of somebody just to tear them apart when you see that they have an old sin nature. whoop de doo so do you. Number 10, intellectual or emotional arrogance. The intellectually arrogant are amusing to me because there's nothing intellectual about them and I can outthink them and run circles around them simply because of the Word of God and uh, they hate me. Intellectual arrogance or emotional arrogance. Emotional arrogance would be the holy rollers. I know holy rollers. And, uh, you know, there's one thing about holy rollers I can say. Now, I'm never their friends, I'll put it to you, because you're, you can't be. But they haven't been critical. Or if they have, it's been hidden. Those with intellectual arrogance, those with self-righteous arrogance, they've been very critical. But those who have this emotional type thing, they see me mention the name God and they think, hey... You're on the same team. You said God. I say God. But I say God this way. I say God and the hallelujah, brothers and sisters. And so they think I'm part of their team. I'm not. And if they were to hear a message about what I really think, they still wouldn't. Well, then they would change their mind. Intellectual and emotional arrogance. Intellectual arrogance is stupid. You think you're so smart. You want to be smart. You want to talk about things that make people think you're smart. How dumb. Who cares? I don't. I don't care what you know. It's not as good as Bible doctrine. I don't care if you know how to make a nuclear bomb. I know how to turn the world upside down through Bible doctrine. Then you have the arrogance, number 11, of Christian activism, and that's just cosmic one for the believer. Just cosmic one. And the activism part, we're going to have to start hammering that home probably more next year as we enter into, feverishly, the election season. And this is going to be the oddest election season you have ever seen and the earliest because people want out of this mess right now. Now, <laughs> we're going to have, look, we're going to have some states vote. Everybody wants to jump ahead. Wake up. This is funny. Maybe not funny to you, but everybody wants to be the first, and I don't blame them. Look, if it were up to me and I was the Republican leader, I'd say, we've got to scrap this whole system. The whole nation votes for the candidate that they want on this day, and that's the primary. And whoever wins the plurality, that is, let's say there's ten people running, the top three get to run against each other. And then the one that gets the lowest vote, the third one gets booted out, the top two run against each other. Whoever gets the majority wins. Boom. You've got your nominee that most of the people in the Republican Party like. It's over. But now we've got states saying, Florida says, I'm going to be before South Carolina. Why should South Carolina always choose it? And I say that too. Because why should South Carolina choose John McCain and that's it? And that's what happened in the last election. 
And the reason why is there's a, a great deal of veterans in South Carolina, and they had respect for John McCain because he was a prisoner of war, and he did go through hell on earth, but that doesn't make him right in politics. It just means he did an honorable thing for his country and suffered. But it doesn't mean he's right. So South Carolina votes for him, and boom, he's the nominee, and boom, he loses. This time around, it's got to be a conservative or the same thing will happen. Every time a conservative run, runs, he wins. It's all in history. Except in one time, and that's because the conservative was a Jew. And people have a thing against Jews, as we'll learn as we go through and study the Word of God. So we are now getting into some mechanics. The 11 gates of the cosmic system for believers. And it was the cosmic system that blinded the unbelievers to whom Peter was speaking when he shouted at them and said, You tilled the Lord Jesus Christ. And then some responded and believed. Now isn't that something? So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us, challenge us, and make us to understand that your word, you glorify your word even above your name, that the Lord Jesus Christ glorifies his word above his name, and that we need to come to know the word and absorb it into the seven compartments of our stream of consciousness so that you can be the one that can save this nation, that can turn this world upside down. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. Amen.